Okay, so um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm going to follow up Xavier's presentation because um, I will I will um, zoom out what uh, Xavier presented in his first part of his presentation. Um, so basically, the degradation of the, the polymer, and uh, I will focus on the material which is uh, studied uh, in the Team Cable uh, Consortium, which is the crosslink polyethylene. Um, so basically, I will present, as it is stated in the outline of the presentation, um, two main things. Um, so after a reminder of the XLP uh, structure, microstructure, uh, I will present the modification of the degradation uh, in the amorphous phase of the, of the polyethylene. And I will also focus on the modification of the crystalline content and the microstructure of this uh, material. And to do so, um, I will present different characteristic physical chemical techniques uh, uh, in order to, uh, to, to, to tell the story about what is going on in this material. And um, at the end of this uh, presentation, I would try to, to make a relationship between the, what is occurring in the material during the degradation process and uh, with the uh, mechanical properties uh, of, the, of the material. So XLPE um, is um, a semi-crystalline polymer, which is um, cross-linked. So basically, what you have is a polyethylene, which is produced uh, from a monomer, the ethylene. And you have a uh, first, uh, let's say, first synthesis, which, is, uh, which consists in producing uh, linear uh, poly polyethylene chains. Uh, this material is a thermoplastic, meaning that it can be melt and can be in the molten state at high temperature. With the crosslink polyethylene, you have the same microstructure, except that you would have chemical bounds between the chains, so, meaning that the amorphous phase is uh, connected with covalent bounds. In that case, uh, you have an elastomer, which also have the uh, crystalline parts inside the material. So this material is in the rubbery state, meaning that the Tg is very low, and at room temperature you have this rubbery uh, behavior. And um, it melts at a temperature, um, well, the crystals disappear at a temperature, let's say, uh, around 130, even low, lower temperature. But above this temperature, the material, since the crosslink exists, doesn't melt, doesn't transform into liquid, you still have a rubber. So we are in Italy, and uh, the best way to represent the, uh, the polymer, well, with spaghetti. So I'll try to, to make the drawing to, exp to explain, to illustrate what Xavier explained earlier in his presentation, the two main mechanisms that are um, occurring during a degradation of a um, Poly, uh, or polymer. So you have the chain scission, where basically you would have a cut of the polymer chain in the middle to create uh, two chains, two separated chains, and a cross-linking event, which will connect uh, two polymer chains uh, inside the, the material. So the objective of the, of the, the presentation, of my presentation, is to try to uh, correlate the uh, macromolecular modification that are observed through different techniques with the macroscopic properties, the evolution of the macroscopic properties. So I said I will focus on the modification on the, of the amorphous phase. So the amorphous phase is where the um, degradation mechanism occurs. So the objective of the first experiment I want to show you is to characterize the evolution of the, uh, this amorphous phase and how the uh, chemical reaction will modify the macromolecular network. 
So the first experiment I want to show you is the um, swelling tests that are um, performed in order to uh, characterize the, uh, the, um, the network inside the material. So the swelling test is a, is a typical experiment um, used when, actually, when you have a, a, a solvent and you put a thermoplastic inside a good solvent, it will dissolve uh, black sugar in water. But if your sample is a network, if, it's, if it is an elastomer, it won't dissolve into the, into the solvent, it would just form a gel. So you would have a, the molecule of the solvent, which will swell the sample, and the swelling, the swelling, um, the up, solvent uptake inside the, uh, the, the sample will give information about the uh, macromolecular network. So the formula on the right are written just to uh, show you different um, properties that can be calculated uh, through the characterization of the um, uh, swelling experiment. Um, on the left bottom, you will see also uh, a sample after swelling in a good solvent, which is the pig xylene, and after drying this solvent to remove the solvent uh, from the, the, the material that has been swollen. By using different equations, we can calculate the concentration of uh, chains that are connected together, which are called the effective chains, which constitute the uh, macromolecular network. This concentration can be plotted as a function of the aging time and can uh, be related to the degradation of the material throughout the aging process. So basically, when you look at the evolution of this uh, uh, concentration as a function of aging time, this, this one is, a, this, sorry, is the gel fraction. But with the gel fraction, we can have the, uh, the, uh, the concentration of the effective chain. Um, in the condition that we studied in the project, uh, we observed that the uh, very uh, early time of aging uh, will produce samples that are readily soluble in the solvent. Basically, we cannot characterize the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the gel property of the material because the transition reaction are too high to get, at the end, a gel sample. So basically, we had to, to switch to another characterization technique uh, in order to calculate the concentration of effective chain uh, inside the material. So to do so, we use another technique, which is uh, rheology, which basically it's a mechanical, uh, a thermomechanical characterization technique, uh, which gives you a, a, uh, information about the, the viscoelastic properties of the material. Um, and through this um, instrument, through this uh, experiment, uh, we can extract elastic, elastic and viscous moduli uh, as a function of uh, temperature. Above the melting temperature, there are no more crystals. And basically, what you are uh, looking at is the rubbery plateau, which is only due to the uh, cross-linking inside the material. And by using different uh, kind of uh, geometry, uh, e either in the solid state with the tension mode or in the shearing mode with the molten state, you can calculate uh, through this uh, equation, the E prime, uh, the, sorry, the nu, which is the concentration of the effective chains uh, by measuring E prime, which is the elastic modulus of your material. And by Looking at the two methods, so the swelling tests and the mechanical test uh, with this uh, experiment, we are able to have a good correlation between the, between the two uh, uh, 
uh, experiment uh, with the calculated effective chain in the macromolecular network. So that is represented here on the, on the graph, the figure on, on the right, where you have the empty symbols and the full symbols, the field symbols, sorry, uh, measured by swelling or uh, rheology. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but these are the different conditions that have been studied and compared uh, with the um, aging, uh, aging time. So this gives us um, an idea about what is going on inside the macromolecular network, mainly chain scissions. And chain scissions, not, they, they, are, they also can produce other modifications which are related to the crystalline structure, the crystalline microstructure. So that's what I'm going to present in this uh, second part. And I'm going to, to show you how the uh, crystalline contents and the microstructure of the material can be modified through different kinds of aging. So the first technique that we use uh, to characterize this uh, crystalline content is called DSC. So DSC, it's a thermal analysis technique, which consists in heating a sample, or cooling down a sample, in order to um, melt or crystallize or look at the um, glass temperature transition of the material. It's based on a heat transfer between a sample and a oven. So it measures the heat transfer between the sample and the oven. And it's, uh, it's related to a change of properties, which is the heat uh, capacity of the material uh, at the transition, uh, glass transition, crystallization, crystallization temperature or the melting temperature. So on the right, you have one uh, cross-link polyethylene sample that has been heated, that is the black curve, cooled down, which is the blue curve, and heating up again, which is the red curve. What you can see is you have a, a peak. With the, let's focus on the, on the black curve. You have a peak that corresponds to a endothermal, endothermal uh, event, which is basically the melting temperature. This peak is wide, um, can give you an idea about the melting temperature of the crystals, and can also give you an idea about the uh, crystalline content of your material. In that case, crystalline ratio inside this material is, has been calculated with 41%. So you have 59% of amorphous phase, and the rest is the crystals. As I said in the previous slide, you can look also at the uh, melting temperature. And with the melting temperature, it can give you an idea about the uh, size of the crystals inside the uh, material. And the question that is presented here, the first equation here, uh, relates the lamellar th thickness, LC, with the melting temperature here. And this um, melting temperature will give you, um, by including constants that are known for polyethylene, um, can give you an insight about the uh, evolution of the lamellar thickness compared with the uh, aging condition. As I said also, the integration of the peak can be related to the um, crystalline content. And the value you need to, the formula you need to, uh, to, um, to look at is this, uh, this formula. Basically, it relates the uh, enthalpy of the melting enthalpy of the peak of uh, melting peak that is uh, uh, shown on this, uh, on this thermogram and which is compared to a uh, sample, which is a theoretical sample, uh, which has been crystallized at 100%. Uh, the value for polyethylene is at uh, 292 joule per gram and is well referenced in the many, uh, many papers. If we look at different aging conditions, either thermal aging or radiolytic aging, we can see that the behavior, the aging behavior, or actually the, the thermograms that are associated to the sample that have been aged through different conditions, 
this thermogram evolves differently. Um, let's take a look at the, for instance, the thermal energy. So we will have a precondition that has been studied here, 87 degrees C, 110 degrees C, and 130 degrees C. For the 87 degrees C, for the aging time that has been um, uh, studied, basically you have very low evolution of the melting temperature. It will remain almost constant, and the shape of the peak changes slightly. Have a shift, a sharpening of the of the peak towards higher temperature. Let's take a look at the 110 degrees C. In that case, the, the aging temperature is much higher. So you have two uh, different things that happens. You have a shift of the melting um, temperature towards uh, higher temperature than at 87 degrees C, and a higher sharpening of the, this melting peak, meaning that uh, if you relate to the gibbs thompson formula on the previous slide, meaning that you would have an hour of population of the uh, lamellar thicknesses. And for the 130 degrees C, the shape is completely different. It's really easy to understand because at this temperature, basically all the crystals during aging are molten. So when the sample is aged, the crystals are, are not there anymore. And it will only crystallize when the sample will be removed from the oven. And that's the reason why you would have different kind of shapes. Even lower melting temperature than at 110 degrees C, just because that when you will remove the sample, it will crystallize again. When we look at the radiolytic aging, well, at this uh, radio, uh, for this aging, the temperature, the aging temperature is uh, quite low. And the crystals, basically, they are not very sensitive to the um, to the uh, actually the melting temperature associated to the crystals is not sensitive to the to the aging condition in the radiolytic, radiolytic conditions but we can sti still see that the, um, the, um, the the shape of the peaks um, uh, differs and uh, just to uh, quantify a little bit more this uh, this evolution uh, I just plotted some, some of the properties that we were talking about previously. So about the melting temperature, basically we don't see any change for uh, the radio, radiolytic aging. But for the thermal aging, as I said to you, the, uh, the more pronounced uh, evolution is for the condition at 110 degrees C, which is below the melting temperature. And at 130 degrees C, well, as I said, crystal erasing will produce uh, a lower melting temperature because of a recrystallization. As for the crystallinity uh, ratio, when we look at the, um, this um, property uh, and we look at this uh, property as a function of different aging, either radiolytic or thermal aging, what you can see is that with radiolytic aging, we only see an increase of the uh, crystalline content inside the material. So it was not very obvious by just looking at the thermogram, but by integrating, we can see that we have an evolution from 42% to, to 54%, which is not negligible. And for the thermal aging, well, basically it's a bit random. Hard to explain what is the, going on inside this material. But to, to sum up a little bit this behavior, the crystalline ratio is closely related to a phenomenon which is happening during the, the, uh, the aging of the material, which is called the chemical crystallization. When you have transition uh, reaction, which are close to the crystal, the crystal can crystallize furthermore. And that's the reason why you would have an increase of the crystalline ratio inside the material. And this increase is well defined with radiolytic aging, but less pronounced with thermal aging, just because when you have an aging at, with the radiolysis, uh, the temperature conditions are favorable to the formation of the crystal. But with the thermal aging, well, for some temperature, it will be favorable, for instance, 110 
10 degrees C, but for other temperature, like 130 degrees C, it will not be favorable because you have other phenomena that, uh, that occurs. So I was talking about DSC, which is a, a thermal technique to characterize the, um, the evolution of the microstructure. And now I'm going to talk about another technique, but which will also um, study, which will also uh, allow us to study the microstructure, the same microstructure of the, of the material, the evolution of this microstructure as a function of aging. And the goal is to compare these two techniques, thermal one and the ambient one, with the uh, diffraction scattering technique, and try to see if there is any logics into uh, to this comparison. So the technique I'm going to show you is based on X-ray diffraction. So X-ray diffraction uh, can be made in two, uh, with two setups. The first one is called wide angle X-ray scattering, wax. It's basically um, a, when the sample is very close to the detector. And when you have an incident X-ray beam, which irradiates the sample, and the sample will diffract this incident beam. This is when you have this setup here on the right. This setup will allow us to uh, um, probe uh, small distances inside the material. And when I'm talking about small distances, I'm talking about the unit cell dimension of the, of the lamella inside the material. Okay. The second setup with the same I would say instrument. Uh, it's called small angle X-ray scattering or SACS. In this setup, the distance between the sample and the detector is much higher than for the wax uh, setup. But it's the same. You have also the, the X-ray um, incident beam. You have the detector. You have the sample. And in that uh, setup, you would have another microstructure dimension inside the material which will be probed. This dimension is not the unit cell of the lamellar thickness, is the stacking of the different lamellae. So the distances that are probed inside the material are much higher. Okay, We are talking about here for the wax angstrom to nanometer, the dimension of the unit cell of the, of the crystal. And here we are talking about up to several tenths of nanometer, even hundreds sometimes. Okay, so we are not probing the same thing from wax and from sax, even though we are with the same setup instruments in, uh, with the material. So the first setup I want to, to, to show you is the wax setup. So with the wax setup, as you say, small distances, we are looking at the unit cell of the crystal. And the crystal, well, the polymer chain, when they crystallize, they arrange themselves. Uh, close to, to each other, they stack themselves. And this stacking will uh, create planes uh, which can diffract in certain condition of wavelengths adapted to the X-ray uh, wavelengths. And you can have an idea by looking at the diffraction peaks that you can see here. Uh, these are the characteristic peaks for polyethylene. You can probe the dimension of the crystalline unit cell. For the um, for this case, for the poly, crosslink polyethylene, when we age this sample in different conditions, basically this uh, value doesn't change at all. The peak position that you can see here, they don't move. So that means that the crystal is not affected by the um, thermal aging or by the uh, radiolytic aging and confirms a little bit that the uh, degradation mechanism occurs in the amorphous phase. Second thing that we can extract from this uh, data is um, a value that we can compare with the DSC analysis. Uh, that is to say the, the crystalline uh, contents. And by looking at this um, diffraction pattern here, you can extract the amorphous 
phase, which is the very wide peak in red, and the crystalline peaks that are in blue. And by simply comparing the area under the peaks of these two regions, you can calculate a degree of crystallinity of your material. So that's what we did for wax. And we also compared with the DSC results that we obtained through the thermal analysis. And we can see that basically, even though this uh, evolution for the thermal aging, for instance, is very chaotic, the comparison between DSC and wax are very good. And we can have both uh, analysis through the um, both techniques, wax and sax. Um, for radiolytic aging or for thermal aging, we can compare these, uh, these two techniques and are very uh, well, um, well correlated. The only uh, difference we observed, and we have some trouble to explain this, uh, this discrepancy, uh, was for the initial sample where we could see a difference between the uh, DSC result and the wax, and we could only uh, ex explain it by saying that uh, the small crystals that can be detected by the DSC techniques cannot be detected through the wax diffraction. That's the only uh, discrepancy that we uh, observe. Otherwise, the, uh, it was uh, really good. The second technique that we uh, wanted to, uh, to, uh, to, to use was the, the SAX analysis. So as I said, the SAX analysis um, is to probe the distances um, within the microstructure. So to just to, to, to be clear with the wax analysis, the wax analysis, I don't know if you can see my, can see my arrow here? Yeah. yeah. Um, the wax analysis, the unit cell is what I draw with my arrow here. Okay, so it's very, very small compared to the distances that are here, represented here. Uh, with the um, uh, lamellae, crystalline lamellae, and the stacking of uh, crystalline lamellae, amorphous phase, crystalline lamellae, and so on and so on. So the distances that are probed through this technique are, um, so you have the long period here, the uh, crystalline lamellae thickness, and um, not going to, to, to show you how to calculate this through SACS, but I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to, to tell you that we calculated actually this crystalline lamellar thickness uh, through DSC. And we can deduce by um, measuring LP and LC, we can also deduce LA, which is the, uh, the thickness of the amorphous phase um, in the uh, stacking of this, uh, this microstructure. So to do so, what we have is this kind of uh, 2D pattern that we need to integrate through this direction. So we need to integrate through uh, phi. And by doing a simple um, mathematical uh, transformation, uh, we can evidence the main peak of uh, scattering inside this uh, spectra, which are shown here on this, uh, on this graph. So this is a um, different sample that can be aged at uh, 400 uh, gray power at 21 degrees C for different duration. And you can observe, well, different things. First, what you can see is the evolution of Qmax. Qmax is related to directly to LP. So uh, the long period I was talking about in the previous slide, you can relate through this formula with Qmax, the position of Qmax. By using the LC calculated with DSC, you can also calculate LA to deduce the uh, thickness of the amorphous phase. And what you can see on this graph on the right is the evolution of these three lengths. So you have LP that is decreased as a function of aging time. And you have LC that is increased. So the consequence is LA is decreased as a function of time. OK, so just try to remind what I'm saying now. LA is decreasing. The second thing that you can see with uh, the SACS analysis is that the intensity of the peak is decreasing. I don't know if you noticed here. 
as a function of the uh, duration here. The maximum here slowly decreases, and for, in some cases, it also decreases up to zero. So it decreases to zero for the same exposure condition, the same experimental Sachs conditions, okay, analysis. This peak, or the intensity of this peak, or more precisely, the integration of this peak, is directly related to the contrast between the crystalline phase and the amorphous phase. Okay, so it's directly related to the electronic density in the crystalline phase and in the amorphous phase. And if you followed the, well the presentation of uh, Xavier earlier, he said that many, many oxygen atoms graft on the chains of the polymer during the aging. Basically, what you are seeing here is the oxidation grafting, the oxygen grafting in the amorphous uh, chains that will change the contrast between the crystal and the amorphous phase. And at the end of aging, basically, you don't have any contrast. You just have plain uh, no more contrast because the density of the amorphous phase is very close to the density of the crystalline phase. This was also confirmed by density measurements. So the density measurements um, was another way to cross-check the different observations made by Sachs. Density measurement is to, um, uh, well, the setup is really easy. You have to measure um, the sample in air, then in a solvent or a liquid in which, for which you know the density, and then you can extract through different uh, formula that I've written here on this, on this slide. You can extract different things, uh, including the density of the amorphous phase, which is really interesting. By doing so, what we observe as a function of aging time, we do see that the amorphous phase increases as we already uh, uh, guessed with the Sachs measurements. So oxidation is really interesting in terms of uh, when we want to cross-check different, with different techniques because we can really see this uh, evolution as a function of time. So now I want to uh, focus a little bit about the, um, the um, evolution of the mechanical properties. And I want to uh, briefly present uh, two, characteris um, two techniques, characterization techniques. One which is um, um, local, uh, which is the micro indentation, and one which is a little bit more um, global with the, um, the uh, tensile tests and try to compare the different uh, techniques. So the micro indentation uh, technique is a mechanical uh, texting method um, that induces uh, the use of a tip which has a certain geometry and this tip um, depending on the force which is applied to displace the sample in to display inside the, the, the sample, um, you can extract uh, different values such as the Young's modulus, um, depending on the values you use to extract this um, Young's modulus. So in the middle here, you have an embedded uh, sample. Basically, um, it's a film of, uh, I think it's uh, 400 micrometer thick. And what is shown here in this embed sample is the thickness. So we are looking at uh, how the mechanical properties are changed throughout the thickness of the film. Okay. Um, when we um, punch this sample uh, with the Vickers tip here, we can have a nice uh, square shape indent. And depending on this um, uh, the height of depth inside the, the sample and the load that is measured during the, the experiment. Uh, with this uh, formula, we can easily extract the reduced modulus here. And with this um, reduced modulus, we can extract the Young's modulus uh, using this uh, formula here. 
By doing so, we try to look at different aging condition and look at the thickness of the different films. So here on the right, uh, in this picture, you see the uh, embedding resin surrounding the sample and the techniques that we use to, in order to have uh, well-defined um, separation between the, uh, the measurements here. So we shifted not only with the, in this direction, but also in this direction in order to be able to probe the mechanical, mechanical property throughout the, the thickness. And we observe different profiles throughout the thickness. The first profile I want to show you is the radiolytic aging here on the left. What we observe is basically there is no, the, the aging is homogeneous throughout the thickness. There is no evolution of the mechanical property. So basically the overall property of the material will be representative of the um, local mechanical properties of this material. When we look at the thermal aging, we do see an, another shape of curve. We see that the Young's modulus evolves very rapidly near the, the, the surface here, but in the core of the material, you basically don't have any evolution of the Young's modulus. And this is basically due to a phenomenon which is called a diffusion limited oxidation meaning that the ox oxygen that is present at the, at the edge of the sample will recreate this um, degradation but this reaction is so rapid so that the oxygen cannot go through the sample and the degradation will mainly occur at the edge of the sample another um, sample that is represented on the right is a combination between uh, radiolytic at very small dose rate and uh, thermal dose rate, uh, uh, thermal aging and we do see that this basically is uh, the same behavior than the thermal uh, behavior meaning that probably that this uh, material the aging of all this material is uh, is um, driven by the thermal uh, oxidation. Ah, that's the Q. OK, it's connected to Internet. OK, now I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to hop, remove the sound. I'm going to talk about the um, tensile tests in order to correlate with the evolution of the mechanical properties. And what we also observe with the um, um, with the evolution of the microstructure. This is a test side test of uh, HDPE, the polyethylene. And what you can see here is a phenomenon which causes friction during the test side test. Probably you, you already know that. Um, this phenomenon is mainly due to the fact that the crystals of polyethylene are very not very solid. Basically, the interaction between the chains inside the crystal is very low. And because of that, the entanglements that are in the amorphous phase can simply destruct these crystals during the tensile test. And that's the reason why you would have a very high epsilon uh, at break and elongation at break at the end of the tensile test. So basically, when you remove these entanglements, when you increase the crystalline content comparatively to the, uh, to the amorphous phase, when you cut the chains um, in the amorphous phase, all is in favor of decreasing the elongation at break properties, meaning that you, this property will decrease because of this uh, different phenomenon. And that's basically what we observe. By doing the mechanical test on this uh, sample, what you will obtain is a decrease of this uh, epsilon uh, at break, um, deformation at break, um, and this is uh, rapid, with the gene condition that we used in this project. And uh, what is interesting is that this property can be related to a dimension of the microstructure that we measured 
in through the X-ray diffraction, for instance. And the, um, this critical uh, property here that we, uh, we put at 50% uh, of uh, elongation and breadth um, correspond to a value of um, amorphous thickness of five nanometer. And depending on the, when it does not depend on the aging conditions. Uh, so if for the red curve, for the green curve, or for the, the, the black curve, we only, we have the same value here, which correspond to the critical value of the amorphous thickness. So with that, I would like to, to conclude uh, with my presentation. So I wanted to show you that um, complementary techniques um, are very useful to characterize the sample and can lead to the same conclusion. And that's a good way to cross-check every result that we can gather with these different techniques. So the first conclusion is the chain reaction, chain scission reaction induces uh, induce a chemical crystallization uh, process. These reactions are in majority uh, compared to a cross-linking cross uh, reaction. Um, this chemical crystallization increases the overall crystalline ratio, and this has to be um, regarding the uh, depending on the on the uh, con aging condition. Huh? I show you that the radiolytic uh, degradation gives. Um, um, a higher uh, crystalline content than for the thermal uh, degradation, for instance. Uh, the radiolytic degradation gives a homogeneous degradation throughout the thickness in terms of uh, uh, this has been shown with the mechanical properties, but the thermal degradation leads to the profile throughout the thickness due to a limited diffusion oxidation. And at the end, the low and high deformation mechanical properties evolution are closely related to the crystalline content and the microstructure, this uh, value of uh, LA, which is the amorphous uh, lamellar thickness. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. understand that because uh, when you measure with Becker's, you measure plastic deformation, right? Yes. And the axonolus is for elasticity. Elastic, I didn't yes. If you could uh, explain for me once, once again how that works. That's a good point. Maybe I wasn't, I wasn't clear because I didn't explain, actually. <laughs> um, when you do this, uh, this experiment, basically you, you, you have a plastic deformation of your sample at the very beginning. That's the red curve. This is the loading phase. After this loading phase, you would have um, um, a time where you stop the movement, but you keep applying the pressure. Okay, and after that, you release this, um, so you don't have any plastic deformation because you waited for the material to 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 have this plastic deformation. But the release of this uh, of this material is basically due to um, elastic properties. Uh, okay, so you measure the difference between the and between the lowest point when you, when you, you exactly you and, you and the in the point when you release. So, so we measure just the elastic deformation. Exactly. And you you uh, just uh, take away the, the plastic part. Exactly. Okay. That's the what we what we in for the green phase. So the release, you measure the slope. Of this, um, of this. Okay, uh, okay. So, so that's the a, S. It's not like a classic Vickers test. Uh, no. It's not there. So because I know the Vickers test for, for for metals and it is kind of different because you release and then you measure the size of the of the indenter after the. Uh, you you do the same also, you, but you measure the size of the of the of the indent by measuring the height at which you you go you went into the material and then okay. you have the area of contact. Of your uh, knowing the uh, the geometry of the tip, so you have the the AC here, and by doing that you can measure this uh, reduced modulus. Okay. By That's using the Oliver and Farr uh, formula. That's interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, I have a question on the, on the same topic. Did you try some cor correlation between so DSC swelling test? It's okay for me. And um, concerning uniaxial traction test, uh, did you try some correlation cor to determine the crossing density uh, by that technique or not? Or? Uh, the cross link density yeah. with the tensile test because you, yeah. and the um, young modulus. So you determine the young modulus by uniaxial traction test, and you try to define with the same rule that you use for the DMA, uh, DMA experiments. That's a, that's, uh, I don't know if it's possible to probe the cross linking density with the young modulus at room temperature. Yeah, at room temperature. Because if you do so, the most contribution, the, the greater contribution, the greatest contribution would be the, the crystal actually inside the, 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 the material. So you would have to, to it's not, um, uh, you would have to melt the crystal, have a molten state, I mean an elastomer, and then uh, do a tensile test. Uh, we haven't done that. We haven't done that. But that could be an idea to probe the, um, the um, the cross-linking density. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, another question concerning the thermogram obtained by DSC. Mm -hmm. uh, the crystallinity ratio is determined on the first curve or on the second? First curve, always. Okay, and um, can you explain why? Because if you compare the first and the second, not on that slide, but before, it's not exactly the before. I agree practice. with you. I completely agree with you. Um, so we have a lot of questions about the topic, so I think we will discuss later. But so we are really you use only the first only in the first uh, gram and not the second. Just to for correlation for radio yes. thermology for thermo oxidation energy. Okay. Basically, because we want to relate uh, the, the the state of the aged sample. Yeah. And for for yeah. this for this for to probe the different properties and to to relate the different properties. And actually, your question is not. Um, um, it can be very interesting because you can, you could probably extract some data from the second curve, um, and that I call the um, recrystallization power of the the sample. I don't know if it's uh, possible yeah. to correlate that, but it can be um, an idea to uh, to uh, to to probe these uh, these properties. Yeah, because the your evolution of the crystallinity ratio concerning thermal aging is quite strange because you don't have any clear trend on your results. So I uh, think if you use the first round, it's maybe a <clears> reflection <throat> that no, no, because it is a crystallinity ratio, not the melting temperature, but the evolution. Yeah, in that case. Yeah, it's not really. Um, it's not really clear. Clear, I, I do agree with you. Um, yes, I have to accept this comment. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a, it's a to 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 be to be honest with you, I prefer the radiolytic aging. <laughs> much more easy to, to explain. No, no, but the conditions we we choose for the for the aging uh, in the thermal condition, it's even hard to compare actually the. Um, the low temperature, let's say 87 and 110 yeah. degrees C, because in that case you would have both degradation of the amorphous phase that will induce uh, a change in the crystalline microstructure. But for the 130 degrees C, it's, it's like you are doing a second eating DSC actually, because you erase the existing um, crystals, yeah. then you degrade in the 100 yeah. amorphous state. Then you uh, decrease the cooling state, and then you yeah. do an analysis with DSC. It's like the second run of your DSC yeah. analysis, so it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. So to compare this data, it's very complicated. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. question yes. Uh, related to the DSC measurements at 130 degrees. Yes. If you can go to the slide where you, this one, yeah. I can really understand the fact that you have uh, very different curves uh, between the among the aging levels, and I agree. But uh, uh, concerning a particular sample, I guess that uh, you have performed uh, these measurements uh, over uh, three or four different points. Uh, the question is: uh, uh, the curve that you obtain 
for a particular zone of the sample. Mm -hmm. Is the same among the different zones of the samples? No. Also a good question. <laughs> Uh, for these samples, we also observe different um, uh, change in color. Ah, for the, uh, so we also have discrepancy. Uh, yes. now these conditions are really not the good condition, uh, to, to my opinion, it's not the good condition to, to be studied, except that it's a really fast aging condition, but completely, well, let's say, um, different in the case of um, try to to extrapolate what is going on at room temperature for instance what uh, lower temperature with the modeling that uh, xavier will probably present uh, on wednesday I, I maybe a correlated question is most more general when we have uh, this sort of recrystallization after we we draw the the sample the idea is that among the different areas we should have at least should have uh, the same values of crystallinity, or it's just ran random depending on. Um, it's um, I don't know. It depends on the oxidation state of your sample, um, because the, the crystal, the formation of the crystal, um, especially for I mean for any kind of polymer, um, when you have a small defect, which can be a chemical defect which can be a branching for polyethylene, which can be um, oxygen that is grafted through an oxidation uh, process. Um, this um, chemical cannot be included into the unit cell of the polymer. Uh, it's simply excluded. So for the, the polymer crystal, it only accepts CH2, 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 CH2. And if you have any kind of, uh, of these uh, defects, well, you will for sure decrease the uh, crystalline content uh, of your material. So if you age your sample at 130 degrees C, you are 100% amorphous, you do oxidation and you incorporate ox oxygen and you decrease the temperature so that it crystallizes, well, obviously you will have a change in the crystalline ratio. But if you do that the same aging at 110 degrees C, the first crystal that exists in the material are not molten during no, aging. No, no, no. And the crystals, well, they remain CH2, CH2, CH2. Yeah. So the only thing you can do is create transition process and increase the uh, crystalline content in your material. Um, but that, that's it, actually. You, you, and so it's completely different. Actually, it depends on the, pro the local properties uh, of the material. Yes. If we have defects or what's yes. Yeah. 